Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome again to another Deep Learning for Science School. I'm really excited to have Des Smet uh, with us today um, to talk about symmetry and equivalence in neural networks, one of the most important topics uh, um, and feats that uh, we'll need to uh, get to to uh, incorporate physics and uh, the physics, physical knowledge in, in our neural networks and the architecture. Um, Tess Smet is the 2018 Alvarez Postdoctoral Fellow in the Computing science, uh, Sciences here at Berkeley Lab. Her current research interests include building neural networks from first principles for rich data types and accelerating existing techniques and creating new capabilities for computational chemistry and material science. Um, Tess earned her PhD in physics from UC Berkeley in 2018. And as a graduate student, she used quantum mechanical calculations to understand and uh, systematically design the geometry and corresponding electronic properties of atomic systems. Tess has been working on um, um, developing neural networks for applications in, in chemistry and physical sciences uh, uh, for a while now. She, uh, she interned at um, Google's accelerated, uh, accelerated Science team, where she developed a new type of convolutional neural networks called tensor field networks that can naturally handle 3D geometry and properties of physical systems. Um, this is a topic that is very uh, close to what we are, um, uh, she will be talking about today. So I'm really pleased to have uh, Tess here. Um, please, uh, Tess, thank you uh, for joining us. Uh, for everyone, please remember to uh, ask questions in the Q&A, not in the chat, uh, that it helps us actually route the questions to Tess. And um, um, yeah, please ask questions. Well, Mustafa, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And thank you so much for having me. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Tess. I'm really excited to be here and to share a bit of what I love about symmetry and equivariance in neural networks. Uh, it's a really large topic, so I'm not going to be able to completely do it justice today, but I'm certainly going to try. And I'm going to hopefully focus on some things that are relevant to kind of the scientific questions that you're interested in investigating. Um, so because this is Zoom and because I can't see all of your lovely faces, um, what I will need your help with is that I really need you to ask questions when I'm saying something that doesn't make sense. Um, so I will also be monitoring the Zoom chat. Um, and what I'm gonna do basically, I'm gonna check in pretty frequently. So after, you know, before I go on to a, a next slide or a next concept, I'm gonna be checking the chat um, I would really, really love it if you ask questions as soon as something comes up that's confusing to you. Um, so please feel free, do not hesitate. Um, this is supposed to be useful. Uh, I don't need to go through all my slides. I'm happy to just answer questions all day. If we don't get past slide five, I mean, that'd be a bit surprising, but it would, it would, that would be fine. Um, yeah, and so with that, I first wanna explain what is this image that I'm showing you. So um, I wanted to give an example of why symmetry and equivariance matter in scientific data. So I thought maybe this would be a good example. On the, let's see, on the left, I always have trouble with left and right. Um, so on the left, we have a water molecule that's just rotating in 3D space. And then on the right, what we have is we have this matrix. And this matrix happens to represent the electronic interactions between the different orbitals on the different atoms of hydrogen, of, of, sorry, of, of water. So that you have the oxygen orbitals, the hydrogen orbitals, and hydrogen orbitals, and kind of it's a matrix because you basically are asking how strongly do these interact, these uh, orbitals interact with respect to each other. The reason why I'm showing you this diagram is to show you while the water molecule being rotated looks pretty simple, you're like, okay, yeah, a neural network should probably be able to understand that a water molecule is rotating. That, that's not too hard. The problem is that a lot of the quantities that we are interested in in science uh, look like this, what is actually the Hamiltonian matrix of water, which as you can see, it transforms in a very complicated and it, it's a hard to, to recognize pattern as to how it's rotating. So if you're asking a neural network to like learn that all of those different matrices actually mean the same thing because they're all just the same Hamiltonian for water, just in different rotations, um, you could imagine that, that that might be difficult. And this is where symmetry comes in, because if I know that I can rotate a water molecule in any coordinate system, and the Hamiltonian matrix also can rotate 
for any coordinate system, then I know that I only actually need one of these Hamiltonians to reconstruct any of them. So this is kind of the power of symmetry um, uh, if, if you employ it into machine learning models. And I'll specifically talk about neural networks, but this applies more broadly to other methods. So let's see if I can get my cursor up over here. Okay. So a quick outline. I want to talk about what kind of assumptions are actually built into neural networks and into their operations. And then I want to talk about more about like why does symmetry appear in scientific problems or just in, in general computational tasks. Um, and then at some point in that explanation, I may have actually reordered things a little bit. Um, I will describe symmetry invariance versus equivariance. This is a, a these two words come up a lot together and often they're used interchangeably, but they actually mean something very different, um, related but different. Invariance is just things don't change under some transformation and equivariance is things do change. So physicists in the audience um, would also recognize the word covariance. So covariance, if it's a covariant tensor, um, that would mean it's an equivariant quantity. Um, so once I kind of maybe disentangle those two definitions, which may actually happen kind of combined with point four, I'll describe how do you actually make models symmetry aware? Uh, and I'll describe kind of the reasoning for why you do it certain ways versus other ways and what you get, uh, the pros and cons of each approach. And then I'm gonna do a case study, which is um, I'm gonna describe how you get uh, symmetry equivariance to Euclidean symmetry specifically in what are called Euclidean neural networks, which is kind of now the superset. It's become the superset of things like tensor field networks, um, Klepsch Gordon nets, 3D steerable CNNs. Um, we all, or we've kind of rebranded them as Euclidean neural networks since they're all equivariant to Euclidean symmetry. And I think that's gonna be something that um, will probably be new for a lot of people. And, um, it, but it should hopefully be insightful as to kind of what are the considerations uh, that you need to think about when making these models. Okay, uh, point five, then we'll talk about just consequences of making your model symmetry aware. Often you make a model symmetry aware for one reason, and then you get a bunch of consequences that were not things you intended. And I can give some very concrete examples from when we made tensor field networks. Uh, then I'll give a brief recap and then I'll put up a slide that just has a bunch of resources, not exhaustive, but better than none on um, just links and papers that might be of interest to you. So before we begin, does anyone have any questions? I will look at the chat. I'll take a sip of my tea, see you more time. Okay, I don't see any questions, so I'll go ahead. Okay, so neural networks are specially designed for different data types, and assumptions about the data type are actually built into the operation. So in these next figures, W is gonna roughly represent the neural network or something learnable, some learnable parameters, and X is going to be whatever I give to that neural network. So if I have a bunch of arrays, so a bunch of data arrays, I might use a dense neural network. This is often considered the most general um, type of neural network. And basically, it's some linear operation mixed in with a bunch of nonlinear operations, but it's all operating on these data vectors. And the assumption built into the network is that the components of the vector are independent. I don't need any special consideration for how these different um, components relate. So there's no, nothing special um, in the relationship between those pieces of data. Okay, if I have a 2D image, I might use a convolutional neural network. And what's baked into a convolutional neural network is that the same feature can appear anywhere in the image and that it actually means the same thing. So if I get a fluffy ear in this part of the image or a fluffy ear in this part of the image, it's a fluffy ear. They don't mean, they're not different types of fluffy ears, they're just fluffy ears. Um, and this has an assumption of locality, that if I, I want to find patterns where uh, pixels next to each other um, are, are, they mean more, so they, they have a closer relationship. If I want to learn about this pixel, I should look at the pixel next to it, and that's going to give me a lot of information. Okay, if we have text, I know maybe recurrent neural networks are, have been superseded by transformer networks, um, but it's still it is good for illustrating this purpose. Um, recurrent neural networks, uh, are expecting sequential data and specifically the assumption that the next input or output depends on what came before. 
Okay. And then uh, graphs, if you have a graph, you might use a, a graph neural network. And I put convolutional neural network because there's actually, there's an explosion of the types of graph neural networks and um, they can all do very different things. And I'm gonna more specifically talk about graph convolutional neural networks where you have sort of a, an aggregation approach that depends on your nearest neighbors. But this is a case where you have some graph which is just topological data. The nodes have features on them. The edges can have features too. Um, and the network passes messages kind of between the nodes via the edges, kind of a broad definition. And then um, I'm putting this one in a special box because as I said, it's pr probably one that you're less familiar with. And if you have 3D physical data, so you have data that was generated in 3D space by an experiment or in a simulation, um, you might want to consider using a Euclidean neural network because data in, in 3D Euclidean space you always have the freedom to choose your coordinate system. And so uh, that assumption is baked into the network. Okay, so these are all, you can see that there's a lot of assumptions going on that I think a lot of people don't talk about with these different networks. And the key thing about these assumptions is that symmetries actually emerge from these assumptions. So for dense neural networks, we do not have any symmetries because we really didn't make much assumptions about um, what data was coming in. Um, if for 2D images, we have translation symmetry. Uh, for recurrent neural networks, this one's kind of interesting. You have time translation symmetry, but only in the forward direction because you're using the same module over and over again. So you're kind of assuming that regardless of when something happens in time, that it should interpret it in the same way. It still takes in the history, um, but the actual module itself is identical. So it has a sort of a forward time translation. Uh, graph convolutional neural networks, not in all cases, um, but in most cases, the, the desire is to have permutation symmetry. I can order the nodes in any order in my computer, um, but it should still mean the same thing if I permute them. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. And then uh, lastly, yeah, for Euclidean neural networks, you have Euclidean symmetry. So I'll quickly see, check in if anyone's got any questions there. I'm also gonna switch the power from my iPad to my laptop to make sure that my laptop doesn't die. Um, okay, I don't see any questions, so I will continue. Okay, so yes, so symmetry emerges when different ways of representing the, the something means the same thing. Um, and you can talk about symmetry in many different ways. You can talk about kind of the symmetry of the representation. So kind of the, the space of possibilities that something can be. Um, operations themselves can preserve symmetry. So if a certain space has a given symmetry, uh, does this operation muck that up or does it preserve uh, that symmetry? Um, and then objects themselves, so objects existing in these spaces, these representations, can have symmetry. So it can get really confusing as to what in the world people actually mean by symmetry. So um, I'll leave out the operations about preserving symmetry for later in the talk, but I'll at least give some examples of what does it mean for a representation to have symmetry versus an object having symmetry. So let's go ahead and t deal with, with 2D images. So translation symmetry in 2D. I talked about this a little bit, but just kind of to reiterate. Features mean the same thing at any location. So for example, I've highlighted, this is a little Kagome tiling. Um, it's a specific basket weaving, but it also shows up in material science in case people are wondering where the name came from. Um, so you have these kind of upside down triangle features and all of those features, if I'm assuming translation symmetry in 2D, I'm saying that all those upside down triangles are the same. They mean the same thing. Um, but this up, this up, um, right side up triangle um, pattern does not mean the same thing. It would mean the same thing if I had 2D Euclidean symmetry where I was including rotations and things like that, but it does not, uh, it's not included if I purely have translation symmetry, which is the symmetry that's kind of assumed by a convolutional neural network. So convolutional neural networks do not think of those as the same thing. They don't think of the orange box and the, and the blue box as the same thing. Okay, so what about the symmetry of 2D objects? So uh, something that I think is kind of interesting is that um, the boundary of your image actually breaks translation symmetry. So a convolutional neural network, purely just convolutional, if you don't tack on a deep or a dense network at the end, it can 
apply to an image that's infinitely large. It generalizes to that case. So it can, it can operate on images of any size. The only thing that limits what size of image you can use is typically the dense layer that's used for classification, for example. Um, so that's kind of interesting. So you can have kind of these sub-symmetries within, within the image, but if you have the boundary, you've sort of, you've sort of fixed the origin. Um, if you put back periodic boundary conditions, you would recover sort of like these discrete translations. So you don't have continuous translation of 2D space, but you have sort of discrete translations, like if you had a unit cell. Um, any questions on that? I don't see anything, so we'll go ahead. Okay, so let's talk about permutation symmetry. Permutation symmetry is the set of sets, or sorry, the, the symmetry of sets. And um, this sort of means that if I have 10 items, I can list them in any order, but it's still the same set of 10 items. So in the case of graphs where this comes up, I might have uh, graphs with a particular topology, like this, this graph in pink here, and I might in memory have the data for each node stored you know, in, in the array location 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Um, but the graph means the same thing if I decided to reorder uh, those nodes. So I don't want my algorithm to be sensitive to the order because the only reason why those nodes are ordered is because of the details of, of how computers compute, just the fact that they need to store things in memory um, and that they need to compute. Oh, there is a Q&A, sorry. Sorry, I didn't understand that the Q&A is a separate from the chat. Okay, Q&A. Um, for each symmetry, can we obtain... Okay, so the question is, for each symmetry, can we obtain a new equivariance transform? Um, let me see. Okay, so I think... Yeah, so, so it's, a, it's a bit circular, because in, in some ways, like, the symmetry means that when you operate, like that there's a predictable way to operate on the object and something's preserved. So in the case of permutation symmetry, um, so, so it's, it's funny because like with symmetry, there's sort of like the, the platonic ideal of what are called groups, um, which like the group of 3D rotations is this platonic ideal. But normally when we think of rotations, we're thinking of three by three rotation matrices or like an axis and an angle. And so the, the actual group is sort of like the ideal of what it means to operate on something with some operation. But how you actually go about expressing that transformation depends on your representation. It depends on, well, what am, am I acting on three by three? Or if I, am I acting on Cartesian space? Um, am I acting on spherical harmonics? Um, what am I acting on? Um, so I'm not sure if that really answers your question. Um, but I certainly do want to, I, I believe the question you're getting at is, um, is important. Okay, so we've got another question. Okay, relationship, okay, the relationships between nodes and edges have to be the same. Yes, okay. Um, one second, sorry. I'm still learning how to like appropriately <laughs> answer the Q&A in live stream, okay. Simply talking about the order nodes in memory, the picture looks like the nodes are different connections after permutation. Ah, yes, okay, thanks for the clarification. So um, what Michael was saying is um, that I'm, I'm just talking about the order of the nodes in memory and not necessarily saying that these nodes are the same. Um, so for example, if I look at node three in the uh, above picture, it's connected to three different uh, other nodes, but in the bottom one, it's only connected to two. And yes, and when I'm labeling them, I'm labeling them just as they are in memory, and not as them being the same. Um, this next example should actually clarify that. Um, okay, and then let me show this one example, and then on above, I'll get to your question. Cool, it's very exciting. Thanks for asking questions, folks. Love it. Okay, 
So if I have a graph, I can also say this graph has a certain symmetry. And I think this is what's touching upon Michael's question. And this is sort of, if you've heard the term graph automorphism, this is where this comes in, where specific nodes are indistinguishable. They have the same global connectivity. So if I look at their next near, their nearest neighbors, they look the same. Next nearest neighbors, they look the same and so forth. So if I kind of look at all their entire connectivity, um, you can have nodes that look the same. So in this little bow tie uh, graph, you can see that the two orange nodes are symmetrically indistinguishable, as are the blue nodes. So hopefully that answers a bit of Michael's question. And now let me check on Anabob's question. Okay, so yeah, permutation symmetry is um, really important in any neural network where you basically have nodes or points or geometry. So anything where you have to store it in memory but it needs to be treated as a set. And so, you know, even when you do a convolution on images, um, one of the ways that convolutions get away from this problem is because they're dealing with geometry. So what you, like how you apply the operation, um, it doesn't depend on, it doesn't at all depend on which index it has in memory. All that matters is, are you in my neighborhood and what is my relative distance center? So that's getting a little bit ahead of other things that we'll talk about, but I'm hoping that maybe that matters, or I'm sorry, maybe that answers your question on above a little bit. Okay. Um, Carrie Ann asking if I can read the question out that I'm answering. Absolutely. Got it. So it doesn't appear. Oh, I see, because some of them are, are in the panel. Okay, so Anabob's question was how is permutation symmetry applicable to neural networks? Uh, neural networks, in my understanding, are directed acyclic graphs, so order matters. Ah, okay. So I think the picture that Anabob is talking about is kind of the picture with all the nodes and the connections um, that people often describe dense neural networks with. Um, so what I'm taught, yeah, so I, I don't think about neural networks that way because I find that confusing. Um, I, when I think of dense neural networks, I literally think about um, this picture here. I don't know if you can see my, I hope you can see my cursor. Um, yeah, so if I basically just have matrix operations applying to vectors, that's what I think about when I think of a dense network. So I don't think of, the neural network it's itself as being needing permutation symmetry is more of like the actual operations of it. I'm not sure if that answers your question on above, but I can try again later too. Okay, thank you guys so much for the questions. I will go ahead and proceed. So we talked a bit about permutation symmetry. Now I want to talk about Euclidean symmetry. And again, I want to emphasize that the reason why we have symmetry in 3D space, despite the fact that like the world is messy and asymmetric is because we always have the freedom to choose our coordinate system and the physical system should mean the same thing. Um, so it's kind of an intuitive because the world is not symmetric and yet there's an underlying symmetry of 3D space because basically if we took everything out of 3D space and it was just empty 3D space, we wouldn't be able to tell the difference if we'd moved a bit or rotated a bit or inverted our coordinate system it would all look the same. So the underlying space and the underlying representation has this symmetry. But we can also talk about the symmetry of geometric objects. And I think this concept is more familiar with folks, especially in chemistry and material science. They're much more familiar with the symmetry of geometric objects, also familiar with the symmetry of 3D space from dealing with things like geometric tensors and three by three matrices and elasticity tensors and, and all that jazz. Um, but I think when people say this object has symmetry, they usually mean the symmetry of the object and not the underlying representation. So this benzene molecule, for example, is highly symmetric. It has a six-fold rotation axis, several mirror planes, several 2D uh, or a two-fold rotation axes. Um, so it's a highly symmetric molecule. In case you're interested, it's in the point group D6H. Um, but I just wanted to kind of introduce the concept that the representation has a symmetry and the object can have a symmetry. Um, so I hope that's a little clarifying. Okay, now let's talk about how do we actually go about making model symmetry aware. And I'm going to use an example of how do we make a model that understands the symmetry of, let's say, an atomic structure. And we're going to take benzene as another example. So the most general way to express 
um, kind of any geometry is to use coordinates. But this is problematic because in general, coordinates are sensitive to translations, rotations, and inversions. So the numbers change. So if I want to give these numbers to a neural network, chances are it's going to be sensitive to any of these changes. But there's sort of three different ways that we might be able to handle this. Approach one, it doesn't matter. We're doing deep learning. Throw all the data at the model and see what you get. That is a very valid approach. And um, in, in many cases, it will actually work um, with enough training and GPU burning and things like that. Approach two is convert your data to a representation so that the neural network can't possibly mess it up. You've basically modded out, you've gotten rid of all of these sensitivities to any choice of coordinate system, or in the case of graphs, any sort of permutation symmetry, like you just have like maybe a number or a set of numbers that describe uh, things about the graph without actually addressing any individual nodes, for example, that would be uh, something that's like an invariant representation. So basically, you mod out all the, the, the tricky bits. And that, that's, a, that's a fairly good approach, too. Approach three, um, if there's no model that naturally handles the symmetry of your system, you can build one. So th these are my feelings, my relative feelings on these different approaches. And it doesn't mean that you shouldn't do them. I'm just saying that it's sort of like levels of, um, I guess, rigor or, you know, you have certain guarantees in certain cases. So approach one is basically the approach of data augmentation. That If I just show my model enough, for example, rotated examples, it'll eventually get the idea that these things are the same. And while that's true that it does learn to give the same output for something, it doesn't actually learn that it's the same. Um, approach, so yeah, so data augmentation, and also if you put const um, constraints in your loss function, which can sometimes be, you, it, it's, very, it's typically very similar to data augmentation. So I'm gonna treat data augmentation and loss function constraints as kind of the same thing. Um, and these are very good approaches, and I'll discuss that. Um, yeah, so approach two is basically changing your input, so making your data fit the model rather than making the model fit your data. <clears throat> and then approach three, uh, we'll go into more detail, but it kind of is more similar to what I talked about in my first slide with how these different models build in certain assumptions about data types. It's kind of that approach of like making a custom network that specifically naturally handles that data type. Okay, so before I go to the next one, I'll pause for a minute for questions and tea. Great. Okay, let's talk about data augmentation. So I said this a little bit in the previous slide, but it's always good to reemphasize. Data augmentation is the brute force approach to making, to teaching your model to be symmetry aware, or at least to emulate it. Again, there's not really a guarantee that it's going to always behave predictably when you rotate an object, but in most cases it will. In 2D for images, typically people get away with um, about two or like a tenfold augmentation. And there's various reasons for that. Image data sets tend to be pretty large and have a lot of rotations within them already. Um, but if you have 3D data, like you're dealing with molecules in 3D space, um, then data augmentation get very expensive. What kind of data? Sorry. Okay. So I'll finish the explanation and then I'll get to the question on the slide. Sorry, I'm realizing that I'm very distractible. <laughs> um, okay. So, yeah, so it's very expensive. So I wanted to give this example of if you're training without symmetry and you wanted to train a model to be able to recognize that this is a cube, you'd have to show it all these different rotations of this cube. And I'm assuming that this is a 3D model. I'm, I'm showing a 2D picture, but it's a 3D model. Um, and there, each of these rotations looks very different. But if my model knows that things are the same up to you know, maybe some rotation or inversion or translation, I only need one example. And so that's very helpful. OK, so now I'm going to go to the Q&A. Uh, what kind of data type uh, is used for the benzene example. Yeah, so that data type would technically be 
a geometry or a geometric tensor. Um, but you can also make invariant representations of the benzene molecule. Um, so there's actually, it's kind of an open question as to what you, how you want to handle that. Um, does that answer your question? Maybe, maybe not. Great, awesome, thank you. Okay, I do wanna emphasize that data augmentation does make sense in many cases, um, particularly if it's very difficult to formalize when two things are similar. So you're like, okay, these things are kind of similar, but I can't like formally show how I transform this one to that one. Um, that can be quite difficult. Um, or if there's some quantity that you wanna conserve, that it's, it's, not so much, uh, it's not so much that you can easily, um, yeah, basically anything that's hard to articulate as, as a group or as a transform, anything like that, then by all means, please feel free to add that to your loss function terms or to use data augmentation, uh, especially things that are kind of messy, like anything that's like, it's approximately similar. Um, so perturbations, things like that. Um, so I think there are, there are cases that make sense for using data augmentation. They don't tend to come up in what I do, um, just because I'm always dealing with geometry. And so you really do need to deal with geometric tensors. Um, but yeah, that totally, totally can be appropriate for your needs. Okay, I will go back to the Q&A. Okay, question is, is there a benefit in terms of self-supervised learning with the equivariant nature of data so that does that influence how neural network structure is also equivariant symmetric? Self-supervised learning. So I'm not exactly sure what you mean by self-supervised learning. I don't know if that means like, um, like an autoencoder is kind of unsee, it's like semi-supervised. Um, but I would say that in general, um, having equivariance and symmetry in your network just always helps. If, if you can make that assumption, safely with your data, which in many scientific data sets you can, like permutation symmetry and, and the symmetry of 3D space are pretty good ones to make. Um, that's only gonna help because you're basically allowing your model to just focus on the actual data and not learning how to understand what a rotation is doing. So I think it makes your model able to focus on the probably the more pertinent features, the things that you actually want it to pay attention to. So I would say it probably helps. So I don't know if that answers your question, um, but that's, that's my answer. Great. Another question, can we learn the symmetry if it's hard for us to write down? Yes, you can. And I actually, I didn't put this in uh, the resources, but I can. Um, there's this really pretty paper by Taco Cohen and friends called homeomorphic it's like variational autoencoders, homeomorphic variational autoencoders, something like that. And there's actually a lot of, there's a lot of people working on this. I do not work on this. So I don't, I don't, there is a way to do it. I don't know how to do it. Again, I, I use the same group for everything. Um, but there are ways of doing this. I don't offhand know what they are. Um, on the last slide, I have a link. There's actually a workshop tomorrow on equivariance and data augmentation. And those, there's, there's, I think there's at least three or four talks on learning symmetries or learning invariance from data. So that would probably be a better source of information to answer your question. Okay, cool. Thanks for the questions. I'm gonna go ahead and continue. So we talked about data augmentation. So that's approach one. Let's talk about approach two. So let's say I have some invariant representation that basically sweeps under the rug all the complexities of the symmetry of kind of how I would most naturally represent my object. I, you know, an, an invariant representation might be like, I have a molecule and I say, well, an invariant representation is how many atoms does it have and how many carbon atoms and how many hydrogen atoms? Because no matter how many times, you know, I rotate my molecule, it has the same number of atoms. So that's what we mean by sort of an invariant representation. You sort of featureize the data object to have um, these features that don't change under a change of coordinate system or a change of permutation, anything like that. Uh, the nice thing about invariant representations is that you can throw them at any neural network with an invariant representation, or like you can throw them at any uh, neural network. Um, 
and it can't mess it up. It'll be fine. And the nice thing too is that you, if you make a really good invariant representation, you can use it with any machine learning algorithm. So it doesn't have to be neural networks. Um, and I think you see this a lot in like chemi-informatics, materials informatics. People have spent many, many years of their lives crafting these gorgeous uh, invariant representations of, of chemical and material systems that are very effective for certain things. I will say, however, um, if you can craft a good representation, that's fantastic, that's great. Um, but deep learning specialty or secret sauce is its ability to learn representations. And so if you really want to use a specific invariant representation, you may want to go with a different machine learning model. There's so many more interpretable machine learning models than neural networks. Neural networks are sort of the most black boxy. Um, so if you're not using it to learn those features, um, you may just have a, a better time or you might be able to get more out of your model by using like a kernel method or a decision tree. Um, those are all fantastic uh, models for, for getting concrete insights from your data. So that's kind of my, my thoughts on that one. Okay, so one question in the Q&A, invariant representation will need feature engineering effort, right? If so, what's the advantage of deep CNCs in terms of automatic feature extraction? Okay, so this kind of touches upon what we were just talking about. So yes, uh, invariant representations do need uh, feature engineering. That's, yeah, that's sort of the definition. So you can kind of think of invariant representation as equivalent to feature engineering. Um, the advantage, I guess, of a deep CNN in terms of automatic feature extraction is the fact that it's automatic. Um, and also, I think something that can be nice is if you really want to use the fact that your model's differentiable and be able to like, you know, update your input with respect to gradients, which is really a fun game to play. Like, okay, like I put my input through the model and I get some output, but what if I want the output to be slightly different? How does that change the inputs? So if you want to use this differentiability feature, um, which can, especially can be really fun for geometry, um, that can, that, you know, that can be nice. Um, what are other reasons? I guess if you just, you want to sort of be open to being able to toggle on and off different interactions to get between the inputs and outputs. Um, this is something more relevant to Euclidean neural networks where all the interactions in the network have very specific data types. And so you can actually turn some of them off and turn on other ones. And you can actually use that to run experiments as to how important are like vector vector interactions or three by three matrix by three by three matrix interactions. So I think it allows you to ask, it allows you to run experiments. I think that's what is really interesting and, and, and powerful about neural networks is that you can, if you craft them well, then they become little toys that you can experiment with to, to learn about your data, what does and doesn't work. So I hope that answers your question a little bit. Great, thanks. Okay, so now, <laughs> like I said, this actually ended up being in the middle of a different point, but let's really hone this notion of invariance versus equivariance. So invariance does not change under any transformation or anything. It's the, it's the thing that it's, it's the same number, um, you know, mass or like your, your, your mass is the same regardless of your orientation. Otherwise, that'd be a fantastic, you know, weight loss program. It's like you could just gain and lose, lose mass uh, by rotation, but that's not the case. It's a scalar. Uh, so invariants do not change. Um, things that are equivariant change deterministically. So they do change under a specific operation, but if you handed me that operation, I would know exactly how that quantity transforms. So let's take the example of a 3D vector. A 3D vector has three properties. It has a magnitude, which I'm picturing here in orange with the bars. It's got a direction, which I'm picturing with the um, pink arrow. And then it's got a location with the little purple dot. And if we consider how these properties change under translation, rotation, and inversion, they each transform differently. So the magnitude of a vector is invariant. So if I take, if I have two particles and I have some relative distance between them, that distance, that magnitude doesn't change no matter how I change my coordinate system. So relative distances are invariant um, under rotation, translation, and even inversion. Um, 
there's some interpretive group theory dance for you. Okay, if I have the direction, um, it doesn't matter where the vector is located, it still points in the same direction. However, if I rotate it or invert it, it, it is different. It transforms predictably. I can apply a rotation matrix or an inversion operator um, to see how that vector changes, um, but it is different. Last but not least, the location. So points in 3D space are sensitive to all of these. So they're sensitive to translation, rotation, and inversion, except in the very special case where um, the point is at the center of rotation or inversion. But generally speaking, um, it, they do change if, if you know, I rotate around another point or if I invert across another point. Okay, I'll look at the Q&A really quick. What types of properties in materials or chemistry or physics depend strongly on symmetry? All of them. I, I mean, I, okay, that sounds maybe a bit facetious, but, but it, it actually is like all of them. So, um, so for, you know, I don't know if any of you have had a professor who's like, and by symmetry, we can see this, and by symmetry, we can see that. This is, these are the types of arguments that a lot of people um, will use to describe material. So here's an example. If I have a crystal that is um, symmetric under inversion, so I can take x, y, z to minus x, minus y, minus z, um, so I can invert it, uh, there is absolutely no way that that material can host any property that looks like a vector. So it can't have a polarization. Um, it can't, yeah, well, polarization is the first one that comes to mind. Um, and this impacts uh, what the elasticity tensor looks like. So if something has inversion symmetry, it's um, basically like how much it compresses in all directions is the same. It has an isotropic elasticity. I think that's correct. I'm pretty sure that's correct. I think that's the case. So there, there's a lot of um, um, normal modes of materials or not normal modes of molecules. So how molecules wiggle in response to light uh, is symmetry dependent. So there's a lot of them. Um, and I certainly have not done full justice to it in, in answering this question. All right, so I'm gonna go to the next question. What about discrete rotations? Would you say like the cubes? Uh, yeah, so uh, the cubes have a symmetry, definitely. So um, yeah, I should maybe should have included a slide specifically about space groups and point groups. So um, you have 3D Euclidean space. And then there's these subgroups, which are space groups and point groups. It's space groups are how you can tile patterns in 3D space, so all the different ways you can tile patterns in 3D space. And in a lot of these cases, you break certain continuous symmetries. Um, you know, actually, I have a slide for this. Let me just, and we'll come back. Thank you guys for the questions, by the way. I really appreciate it. Where did I put it? So ignore the heading on the top because that doesn't relate to this, to what we're talking about at the moment. Um, but yes, you can have discrete rotations and discrete translations, and that can still be asymmetry, but these are actually subgroups of Euclidean symmetry. So what's really cool is if you have a network that has Euclidean symmetry, you get all of these subgroups for free. So I have Euclidean symmetry in space, but if I put a sphere in space, then the symmetry of my sphere is only 3D rotations and inversions, which is the group called O3. Um, if I put a cone into 3D space, I still have rotational symmetry this way, and I have mirrors along here, um, but I don't have continuous symmetry like this. Uh, if I have a cube in 3D space, I have lost all continuous symmetries, but I still have discrete rotations. Um, I have a three-fold axis along the diagonals, four-fold axis along the faces, and a bunch of other symmetries. And this is, this is the point group OH, or the octahedral point group. The point, uh, octahedron has the same symmetries as the cube, fun fact. Um, and then space groups are what you get if you like, let's say I take a cube in 3D space, and actually this is wrong, it's, it should be a 230 is the space group number. This is an old slide that I forgot to update. Um, if you tile a cube in 3D space, then you recover a specific space group symmetry. So hopefully that, that kind of answers the question. I'll go back to this slide. Great questions. Very exciting. Okay, so I think we were here. 
Okay, so hopefully this clarifies a little bit about what does it mean for invariance versus equivariance. And yeah, it's totally okay if uh, something is equivariant to only discrete rotations. It doesn't have to be all rotations. In this special case for this vector, um, it is all rotations. Um, but a cube is invariant under certain discrete rotations. Um, actually, a vector is invariant under rotations around its axis. So that maybe connects more closely to the question that was asked. Okay, so I wanted to give an example. Again, um, I'm a bit biased because I, I work on, on atoms, and so all my examples are for atoms. So I hope those of you who do not work on atoms do not feel alienated from this. But I wanted to give an example of in, um, some invariant featurization algorithms and how these can actually be really sophisticated and, and especially they can be very expressive if well-crafted. So one such invariant representation are soap kernels. Um, and I have a link to this paper in my resources slide. So there are equivariant operations that uh, then produce invariant quantities. And so I'll talk about what it means to be an equivariant versus invariant operation um, in a later slide, but I just wanted to touch upon this before we move from representations to models. So a soap kernel roughly works like this. So let's say I have this ethane molecule where the um, yellow atoms are carbon and the hydrogen atoms are blue. And I'm gonna project the local neighborhood of those carbon atoms onto spherical harmonics. And I won't go through exactly what that procedure is. There is actually a backup slide showing this um, that I'm happy to go through if that's of interest to folks. But you can basically kind of see that if my carbon atoms here, that this roughly represents where my hydrogen atoms are for this first carbon. And then this represents where the hydrogen and, and this carbon atom over here for, for this other carbon. So we have these two signals you can see that these are equivariant quantities because if we rotate them, they look different. But what we're going to do is that now we have these two uh, equivariant quantities and we're going to basically perform a dot product, kind of the tensor equivalent of a dot product. And that's what we're doing down here. So all this is, is basically showing what this looks like numerically. And I'm separating it by which spherical harmonic they're generated from. There's more spherical harmonics, the higher frequency you go. Um, so this shape just corresponds to these numbers. And what we can do is that we can do a dot product, basically multiply these elements. So this element multiplies this element, and then we sum across the L's, and then we get this number here. So we get these seven scalars. Um, so, you know, this is a simplified version, but it, you know, it's a relatively sophisticated operation. And it turns out these types of operations, if you have enough of them, so you do this for all the different atoms sort of in your local environment, that can be extremely expressive invariant representation of geometry. Um, so that's just to give an example. Okay, so I'm gonna look at the Q&A. Do these networks work well, achieve high accuracy on crystal structures that have periodic boundary conditions? Okay, so I'm gonna assume that you mean uh, Euclidean neural networks. And um, so Euclidean neural networks can handle periodic boundary conditions very naturally. And um, we haven't yet tested them too much on crystal structures just because we don't have enough people using them. So if you would like to do so, <laughs> I, would, I would love to chat with you about that. Um, but uh, if you look at analogous models like Schnett, which is an invariant version sort of of Euclidean neural networks, um, they get pretty good accuracy on several crystal prediction tasks. Um, and so our network should do as well, if not much better, um, purely from an expressivity point of view, like the operations we have in that network is it's just more expressive. It can express more complex interactions. Um, so in theory it should, um, but we haven't totally demonstrated it yet just because of, um, time and, and person power. So yeah. Great. Okay. So now let's talk about invariant versus equivariant models. Um, because we talked about invariant representations, but you could still, for example, give your network, your data and it's full, you know, uh, unaltered glory with all these, you know, the messiness of translations and rotations. And the model can just only operate in a way 
that it's only acting on invariant quantities. So it's only acting on relative distances versus relative distance vectors. So it doesn't have kind of the x, y, z component, it just has the distance. So an invariant model would handle the distance, the equivariant would handle a vector. So for a function to be equivariant, and this is general, this is not with respect to any specific group, this is just any sort of set of operations, a function is equivariant if we can either act on the inputs or act on the outputs. So in the case of rotation, I could take my molecule and I could rotate my molecule, or I could rotate, let's say I was predicting forces on a molecule, I could rotate the forces that were predicted for that molecule. So I could do either, either order. So that operation, that symmetry operation, commutes with the function. Um, so yeah, so I can either do it to the inputs or the outputs. For the case of an invariant function, what that means is that G is the identity. So the inputs to that function um, are going to be invariant quantities, and the outputs to that function are also invariant quantities. So that's what it means to be to, for an equivariant versus invariant uh, function. So any questions on that? Just pause and have a little tea. Okay, question from Anava. Quick question. So the importance of detecting these symmetry or to use symmetry preserving neural networks is to save computation or am I missing something? This is great, yeah. There's many reasons. So the probably the easiest one to motivate is to get rid of data augmentation. So it does save a lot of um, training time. It saves on how many parameters. And um, actually, forget, is this, I'm about to talk about this next thing, but I'll talk about how your data goes further with equivariant functions. Um, there are other reasons too. There's a lot of these kind of unintuitive consequences that I'll talk about that end up being super beneficial. Um, kind of as a spoiler alert, basically Euclidean symmetry has a bunch of really interesting consequences. Space groups, um, point groups, um, geometry, geometric tensors, second order phase transitions. You would think that you needed thermo for that, but actually it kind of naturally falls out just out of Euclidean symmetry. And I'll show you some examples of that if we have time. Um, how are we doing on time? So we started at 9.30, we're about an hour in. Okay. I think we're good. Um, yeah, so I, I think there are more reasons than just computation. I think it's easier to interpret what the model's doing, and depending on how you craft your operations, you can, again, experiment a bit more, saying, like, does this interaction help model my data? Yes, no. But in order to ask those questions, you do have to have a pretty tailored network. So putting effort into the network, you know, makes it a better tool for it answering scientific questions. Okay. Okay, so why limit yourself to equivariant functions? Why not use a more general function? And one of the reasons for this is because you can substantially shrink the space of functions you're looking over. So let's say I have inputs and I have outputs and I want some function that maps my inputs to my outputs. And I know that these pieces of data have some symmetry. Let's say Euclidean symmetry. I know that I can change my coordinate system. Now you could just do data augmentation and teach it to learn about rotations and things like that, or I could have a model that um, kind of inherently has those operations built into it under the hood or it respects those operations. So if I have all learnable functions, that's a huge, huge space. And then there's all equivariant functions, which is a much smaller space. It's still a very large space, but it's still smaller. And physics lives only in equivariant functions. So all physics um, phenomena are equivariant operations. Depends on which group you're talking about, but it's all equivariant. And then if you consider kind of all learnable functions that are constrained by your data, that could be a much bigger space than sort of relevant equivariant operations. And if you inherently wanted to learn a model that um, had the same properties as the um, process you wanted to emulate. Uh, the functions you really wanted to learn are kind of the overlap of equivariant functions and functions constrained by your data. So by constraining your network to be equivariant, your data goes a lot further because you, you're basically being a lot more specific. You're, you're narrowing in on which function you want. You know, okay, well, I want it to be equivariant. Okay, 
cool. You've narrowed out that space. It's like, okay, and then I have this data and it needs to be compatible with this data. It's like, okay, well that, that narrows in on this spot. So it makes your data a lot more powerful. Okay, so I will go ahead and look at the Q&A really quick. Do we need to implement function G as a neural network layer? Ah, great question, no. This is just a property of the function. This is more of like, this is a condition that your neural network must satisfy. You never have to know what G is because you prove it for all G. So it just is the case. And this is really interesting because you don't have to know the symmetry of the object for it, the symmetry to be preserved by the network. The network doesn't know the symmetry of your object. It never does. It's just, I, it just says, I'm going to act in a way that preserves whatever symmetry this thing has. And what's really interesting is computationally speaking, um, knowing what something is versus preserving a certain property it has are two very computationally different tasks. Um, like it's really easy to make something permutation, have permutation symmetry versus like, it's actually really difficult to tell if two graphs are the same. Like graph isomorphism is like very hard problem. Um, but ensuring that if they're the same, you get the same answer, um, that's a lot easier. Now, another graph might also give the same answer, and that's why isomorphisms are hard. Um, but yeah, I think that's really important that the symmetry equivariant networks don't actually know the symmetry of whatever you're giving them. They just can't violate it. You're just kind of handicapping them. You know, you're tying their hands behind their back saying, okay, you, you will preserve rotation and translation and inversion operations. Um, Great question. Okay, another question. Have you done benchmarking of Euclidean neural networks on different predictions against other high-performing models, such as different types of graph neural networks? Um, I have not, but my good colleague, Ben Miller has, well, I mean, we, we did, but Ben did, did really all the heavy lifting. Um, so we do have a paper out on archive right now, benchmarking against QM9, which is a data set on um, small molecules, and I'll link that in the, or I have the archive number in the resource slide. Um, and it is a top performer on a predicting dipole moment, the quantity, the magnitude, which is interesting because it's secretly a vector quantity, even though it's a scalar in that data set. Um, yes, yeah, so we have, but we would like to do more benchmarking, but again, um, there's only so much time in a day, unfortunately. So thanks for the question. Okay, another question. Systems governed by partial differential equations, uh, like say fluid turbulence, have symmetries and conservation laws. Yes, they do. Um, you've shown some excellent examples of atomic physics, chemistry. Do you have pointers on how one might derive symmetries of PDEs and incorporate them effectively, either through data transformations or constructing clever models? Um, and then says something about Lie algebra is incomprehensible math. I'm totally there with you. I, I, Lie algebra is, is a bit of a mess. I mean, it's very elegant, but, but it's, 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 it's not the most fun thing to learn. Um, yeah, so PDEs, PDEs are really interesting. So there's a bunch of work in like neural ODEs and, and basically um, constructing models where if you kind of know the partial differential equation you're solving, um, you can either like fit certain parameters that are unknown. And this is, this is out of my element. Um, Stefan Hoyer at Google, I worked with him while I was on the Google Accelerated Science team. This is like, this is something he's super passionate about. And I think Mustafa and Steve, I, I, and Wahid, I, I think you guys are probably more plugged into this than I am. So maybe, uh, maybe you, you can provide some, some suggestions. Um, I know very little about using neural networks to solve partial differential equations. Um, I think there's a lot of really interesting um, stuff coming out. Um, I think those methods coupled with a Euclidean neural network could be super powerful. So really excited about any potential um, applications there. Um, yeah, I was talking with Stefan about that once um, and saying that that would be kind of the next step for some of the stuff that they're doing in, in 3D. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not a bit I'm not as helpful about discussing things about partial differential equations. It's a little bit outside my knowledge zone. There are a few papers. I, I can point them to the papers. If you want to ask your question on Slack, I can uh, uh, send you some papers later. Cool. Thanks, Mustafa. All right. So another question. Uh, does applying symmetry work well with transfer learning? Does applying equivariant constraints make it more challenging to apply your network trained on one data set to another? Um, would you have to change symmetries and constraints when working on the other data set? Great question. 
Um, so typically you would do transfer land, like say between different sets of molecules or, um, so I would typically stay within the same symmetry. I, I don't think it would, I can't immediately think of a use case where um, you would want to apply like a permutation symmetric graph to um, something that's in Euclidean symmetry. I mean, you could, you could, um, but typically again, the data type kind of governs which neural network you use. So you can, you definitely get very good transfer learning between um, like differing molecules or different sizes, like instead of you train on 10 different molecules at a very high accuracy calculation and you extrapolate to 100, um, these types of methods actually do really well with that. So that's, it, it does seem to be very helpful. And what's been interesting is that there are sort of invariant models that are, so you can take a Euclidean neural network and make an invariant version. Um, and I was actually discussing with some colleagues yesterday that we were trying to figure out exactly why it seems that the equivariant models are performing with, like, they, they're much more data efficient than the invariant ones. Like, it intuitively makes sense. Like, okay, you're able to extract more geometric information more easily, uh, but we don't totally, like, understand mathematically the, the specific mechanism allowing for that. Um, so I would say that equivariant models can often um, do better transfer learning because they might be able to learn more general features than an invariant model. Um, and then compared to a general model, just because their operations are much more tailored, um, they're able to do much, much better transfer learning. Um, okay, and then one more question, then I'll go to the next slide. Um, are you applying a, a Euclidean neural networks after your obtained data, um, like some MD data, or applying your neural networks during the MD simulation? Um, so you can use a trained Euclidean neural network to generate molecular dynamics forces. Um, but typically, like, you first have to train it on some data. So you can do both, but typically you want to do it with a trained network first. There are certain cases where you can actually um, use the network to uncover certain things, and that's in later uh, slides, which I'm not sure we'll get to, but that's okay. Um, but hopefully that answers your question. Okay, I might, what I might do is I might kind of go through some slides for a bit and then we can go back to questions. Um, cause I haven't even explained to you how Euclidean neural networks work and you guys are asking me a bunch of questions about them. So, um, I better, I better get to that part, uh, so that, so that we can have even, even more fun questions. Okay. So this is basically saying general function space, equivariant function space, your data can do a lot more. Your data can constrain your function much better if it's, it's kind of this better scoped function space. Now, why not go to invariant functions? And so I kind of touched upon this. And the issue is that if, for example, you have, you have inputs X, outputs Y, and you want to map them, and there's any equivariant operation you need to go between X and Y, then you better make sure that that equivariant operation was part of your input features because you won't be able to compute it with the model. So um, let's say, again, we have all learnable equivariant functions, all learnable invariant functions, which is a strict subset. And then we have all invariant functions that are constrained by your data, which is in this gray circle. So what I want to point you to is the functions that you actually wanted to learn, they may actually be an invariant function. In that case, you are great. You have nothing to worry about. However, it could be that it was like an almost invariant function, but there was a bit of equivariance. And in that case, you're going to be throttled on accuracy. And then there's certain situations where inherently what you wanted to learn was an equivariant function and the invariant function is just not going to be able to do it. So these are kind of three different scenarios. Like you're either good, you're like meh, or you're eh. So <laughs> this is kind of the three different situations you can find yourself in. Um, okay. So I want to talk a minute about convolutions and how it relates to local versus global symmetry, uh, because this is really interesting. And this kind of touches upon a lot of the questions you guys have been asking about transfer learning. So convolutions capture local symmetry. So they just look at the kind of um, other points around it or the other geometry or pixels around it and the data on those pixels. And it's, it's only through interactions with features in subsequent layers that yields sort of a more global symmetry. So to give you an example, this is a rubidium manganese chloride crystal, and it has these octahedral motifs. 
in the crystal that occur in different orientations and locations. So if, we're, if we have a convolution that is equivariant to 3D rotation, it'll understand that these two octahedron are the same thing. However, they may be in different contexts. Now, in this particular case, their environments look pretty similar because they're symmetrically um, the same atom, basically. Um, but kind of as you go further out and further out, as you go from layer to layer, it will eventually see, oh, well, my system doesn't have octahedral symmetry. It actually has some space group symmetry due to translations and kind of the local, the composition of all the local motifs inside the crystal. So convolutions in a given instance are really, are, are really sensitive to local symmetry, but it's through communication of all those local symmetries to all the other environments that you kind of get a global symmetric picture. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about how do Euclidean neural networks achieve Euclidean symmetry equivariance? And I'm gonna do this at a fairly high level. Um, because normally, uh, if I give a talk just on this, it is an hour. So just to kind of give context, so Euclidean neural networks are very similar to convolutional neural networks, but rather than operate on images, we operate on points because for the cases that were uh, the, the first applications that we were most interested in, uh, we were interested on atomic structures, and it's just a lot easier to represent an atomic structure as a point cloud, but these methods very readily transfer back over to images. So you can use Euclidean neural networks on, on fixed grids, meshes, any data type is totally fine. Um, so because we're using points, we use what's known as a continuous convolution. So rather than having a fixed grid for every convolution center to apply its operation on, we actually you know, compute the relative distance between each of the neighbors, and then we plug that R vector into our filter function. So our filter function is actually a function that takes in that R vector versus it just being a pixel grid. So there's a slight difference. And of course, one thing that's very different about it is that not only do we have 3D translation, but we have 3D uh, rotation equivariance. So the fact that it will know that this is a benzene molecule, no matter how I translate or rotate it. So again, a quick recap, translation equivariance, the fact that I can identify the bunny rabbit in this image, if it's over here or over there, uh, is stems from the fact that we're going to use a convolutional neural network. And the main feature of a convolutional neural network that allows it to be translation equivariant is that it only uses relative coordinates. I only ever care about how far is point J from point I. Like if point I is my convolution center, all I care about is how far is this point from me? And that relative coordinate system will always move with a translation. Um, but the resulting, the, the output will still be shifted. Um, oh, there's a quick question. Can you share your slides with us? I think Mustafa is handling how those are shared. So I'm going to just note that to Mustafa. Um, so, OK, yes. So translation equivariance, we have convolutional neural networks. Uh, but how do we handle rotation equivariance? And kind of hearkening back to some of the things we talked about, we could do data augmentation, so we could just show it a bunch of rotated bunny rabbits, or the molecules in a rotated bunny rabbit. Um, we could do something invariant. We could have an invariant model where we are only caring not about the direction, the relative direction of one pixel with respect to another, or one atom with respect to another, but just the distance. So that would be a, some radial function. Um, really, we want a network that preserves both the geometry and exploits the symmetry of the problem. So we have something that's similar to a convolutional neural network, except we have very special filters and everything in our network is tensor algebra. So rather than scalar multiplication, we have the tensor generalization of that. And I'll talk about that in the next slide. So our convolutional filters have uh, two components. They're separable into a learned radial function, basically saying like, if I'm this far away, what's my output? And then we multiply it times a spherical harmonic to handle sort of this angular distribution. And the essential reason for this, and I'm happy to go into more detail um, uh, at the end of the talk, but the essential reason why we use spherical harmonics is that they have very beautiful properties uh, under rotation, very nice transformation properties. If I give you a linear combination of spherical harmonics in L equals two, so all these L equals two, and then I rotate my coordinate system, that signal is still only, it's still only L equals two components. So, you can think of it as the angular frequency is preserved. The specifics of like which spherical harmonics of L equals two um, 
it's described by will change, but the frequency of the signal doesn't change. So, okay, I'll take one quick question. One symmetry that I'm thinking about that I don't think you've mentioned is scale invariance. What sort of models can exhibit scale equivariance? Okay, this is a really interesting question. Um, so Euclidean symmetry, we don't assume scale invariance. And the reason for this is uh, physics is different at different length scales. There are models that handle scale invariance. Um, I didn't link to any of them. I know David Worrell was working on some of them. Um, there are definitely papers on this. Um, there's a lot of cases where they'll do this by sort of augmenting their filters. So basically, if you have a filter with fixed weights, you say, okay, I'm gonna take this, I have learned parameters, and then I'm gonna make like five copies of the filter that basically like zoom the filter in and out. Um, so you, you can do this in a sort of way, you can do dilated convolutions. Um, but I think there's also more rigorous ways of doing it. I'm just not aware of it on hand, but it is something that is discussed in the literature. It's very relevant for image recognition because like if you wanna recognize a cat in an image, you wanna recognize a tiny cat versus a, you know, a close-up of the cat. Um, so it's very relevant and there is work on this, but I am largely ignorant of it. So thanks for the question. Okay, so yeah, so we have special filters based on spherical harmonics and learned radial functions. And then we basically have to replace all the scalar operations in our network. So normally you, um, you, you get your filter function and you have your input and you just multiply them and sum. Um, multiplication in this case can no longer just be scalar multiplication. It actually has to be a tensor multiplication or a tensor product. And to give an example of why this is necessary, um, how do you multiply two vectors? So there's sort of three different answers. I could uh, take two vectors, compute their dot product, and that gives me a scalar, so that gives me an invariant quantity. I could take two vectors, compute their, their cross product, and that gives me back a vector. Um, or I could take the outer product, and this will actually give me a matrix. So these are three different ways you could kind of combine or multiply vectors. Um, and so it turns out in Euclidean neural networks, everything in our network is a geometric tensor. Um, which surprised us, and I can talk that, about that a little bit more. So everything in the network now has to obey the rules of tensor algebra. And if you've ever heard of things like clebsch gordon coefficients or Wigner 3J symbols, that's where these things come into play. And if that doesn't mean anything to you, don't worry about it. Um, okay. So what, what do you get from this? Because, you know, this, this seems very mathematically not fun. Um, so what do you get from it? Well, if I give a Euclidean neural network a molecule and a rotated version, and I wanted to predict molecular dynamics forces, for example, the forces that are predicted by the model will be the same as the rotated version, modulo the rotation of the molecule. Additionally, the networks generalize very well to molecules with similar motifs. And again, that's because these convolutions have, are sensitive to local symmetry. They're able to understand local symmetry and then through exchanging messages between different atoms, you can get a global symmetry picture, but that kind of happens in a hierarchical fashion. Okay, another thing is that if I have a Euclidean neural network and I show it these unit cells, so there's a, it's a very easy way to articulate periodicity in, in neural networks or in, in Euclidean neural networks, um, basically using graphs. Um, so when I have a crystal, which is represented by a 3D box that I then tile in 3D space, I can choose to represent this as silicon. I can choose to represent it kind of in the smallest unit cell or the primitive cell, the conventional unit cell or some supercell. To a Euclidean neural network, these all look the same. You're guaranteed to sort of get the same per atom output regardless. So rather than worrying about putting your unit cell in a specific convention, you just give it whatever unit cell you have on hand um, as long as it, um, you know, is numerically precise enough to have the symmetry you want, um, then, then that'll be fine with the network. And then going back to this first example that I showed on my slide, if you train a Euclidean neural network on a single water molecule and a single uh, water Hamiltonian, you naturally get back the rich variety of what this matrix looks like under rotation. So this is what you get. This is the payoff. Of, of all the math that, which by the way, is under the hood. So you don't have to deal with it, um, which is why we made a framework for doing this. And I'll link that in, in, 
Um, okay, so we're coming up a bit on time. So I wanna just quickly go through some unintuitive consequences of equivariance. So if I asked you, for example, let's take this bow tie graph, partition this graph with a permutation equivariant function using uh, into two different sets. So basically split it up into two even groups using ordered labels. So I want you to basically train a model that learns to predict zero, one, or one, zero on each of the nodes. And I ask you to do this. What you'll find is that the network can't do this. And the reason why is not because your model is broken, but because the question is ill posed. So, you know, you could imagine, oh, well, why didn't it learn either the left graph or the right graph? Like, why didn't it learn one of these partitions? And the thing is, the network can't distinguish these two outputs. And so the best thing it can do is produce its average. So it'll actually produce a degeneracy. There's nothing to distinguish the you know, the orange partition or the blue partition to be first or second. They are themselves sets of partitions. And so this is something where the, you know, you're like, oh darn it, I really wanted to use this for graph partitioning. And, and I really need this, this, this permutation equivariance, but now I can't use it. So you have to figure out how to ask your question in a way that still respects the symmetry um, of your data type. So that's kind of an interesting unintended consequence. Um, okay, I'll see, uh, there's a question here. Interesting phenomena, such as coherent structures and spatiotemporal, spatiotemporal systems can be defined as local deviations from the symmetries of the system. Can symmetries be hard to define simply, but presumably can be learned by the neural network? I'm wondering if a neural network that has learned the underlying symmetries of the system can be used to detect coherent structures in new data as broken symmetries. Can you think of a way to build a neural network that does that? So, Thank you for the question. One thing that I, I love about working with these networks is that I've learned a lot. I, like, it's really changed how I think about symmetry. And one of the ways is that I don't think of symmetry as an on or off thing. So when we talk about space groups, it's either in a space group or not. But when, we, when it comes down to it, what symmetry is, is the cancellation of certain interactions. So like, you know, if I have an atom to my left and an, and an atom to my right, um, I can get canceling contributions if they're like equally spaced from me. Um, but if one's slightly to the right or you know, slightly perturbed, it's still a fairly symmetric configuration. I will mostly get cancellation from those two quantities. And so again, these networks don't necessarily, uh, I don't know specifically about making a network that detects partial symmetries, but even if you do have something that's perturbed, um, that it's gonna be hard for the network to fight the fact that it still looks mostly symmetric. Um, and this, this actually does, this is physical. Um, we often think, oh, if I you know, take a, a hill and I roll down the hill, or like if I perturb a little bit, then I roll down the hill, but that's assuming dynamics. And dynamics can make small changes grow. But if, if I'm just doing a snapshot, like here is my mostly symmetric object, predict something, you're not gonna suddenly get like a super asymmetric prediction because how would that asymmetry have been generated? Uh, so unless you learned like a really huge weight to be paid onto this very small difference, it won't really be able to um, amplify that perturbation. Um, I'm not sure if that actually answered your question, but I think it was related. You can craft, I believe you can use, for example, including neural network to detect spa uh, space group symmetries. I think you can do that. How you would articulate it is actually a little complicated because of how you'd represent like certain symmetry operations. And I assume that nuance would transfer over to other groups if you, in case you're interested in things that are not the Euclidean group. Um, but again, as far as for building neural networks that can learn or detect certain symmetries, I highly recommend the workshop that I'm gonna put on the resource slide because they might, they might have some better answers for you. Okay, and then one more question. When optimizing Euclidean neural networks, do we have issues of getting stuck in degenerate subspaces? Yes, you do. Um, and I will talk about that in another slide. So first I wanna just emphasize that, um, okay, we have some minutes. So equivariance, yes, again, can have unintended consequences. And so the input, intermediate and output data of neural networks must be geometric tensors. We didn't realize this when we started. We just wanted a network that had rotation equivariance. We're like, all I wanted was rotation equivariance and I got geometric tensors, space groups, all this other stuff. Kind of goes to show that sometimes it's worth 
going through the hassle of getting that echo variance because you may end up getting a bunch of things that you secretly wanted but you didn't know that you could get. Um, so geometric tensors, these really just lovely objects. I'm extremely biased because I work with them all the time. Um, but essentially, like, let's say I have a three by three matrix, which I'm representing uh, with these colors and the x, x, and x, y, and all this stuff. Um, I could equally represent that as a linear combination of spherical harmonics, so as a shape. So it's interesting because geometric tensors can be as much thought about as geometric shapes as uh, numerical objects. And then you also get a bunch of really interesting data types when you deal with geometric tensors. So for example, in 3D space, there are four distinct vector-like quantities. There's sort of the classic vector, which is uh, equivariant under inversion, equivariant under rotation, and invariant under reflection along um, the uh, vector. Um, a pseudo vector does not flip when you invert space. Um, then if you have a double headed ray, it has a lot of the same properties as a vector, except for you can invert it. Um, and then you have things like a spiral, which you can rotate it by 180, but you can't invert it. So there's all these kind of little data types and you can actually articulate specifically like this is a spiral into the network. So this granularity of defining what your object is, is super, super fun, super useful. Okay, um, so Euclidean neural networks also, they can produce outputs that, the outputs must have equal or higher symmetry than the inputs. So these are two different situations. I'm gonna input either a tetrahedron, so I'm gonna input a tetrahedron geometry or an octahedron ge geometry. And these are the outputs of three randomly initialized models that have been asked to generate spherical harmonics from L equals zero to L equals six. And you can see that these shapes all look substantially different but they all have the same symmetry as whatever I gave it as input. So there's many different ways to produce signals that have a certain symmetry. And so this is sort of something that we realized after the fact, um, but that's been useful. And one reason why it's useful is that you can use, and this, this pertains to, I believe, Nicholas's question um, about do you end up getting degeneracy issues? Yes, you do, but you can also figure out a way to get out of them because of the equivariance of your network. So equivariant neural networks can be used, at, and this, this follows for any equivariant neural network, not just Euclidean ones. Um, the Euclidean ones produce nice pictures, um, but this also works for permutation equivariant neural networks and, and other things. Um, you can use them as symmetry compilers, uh, and you can use them to find symmetry implied missing data. So I'm gonna take two tasks. I'm gonna start off with some geometry. Let's say this rectangle, a specific rectangle. So I'm gonna show this specific rectangle. And I'm gonna say, I want you to learn displacements of these points to form a square. Then the task two is kind of reversing this. I'm going to give you a square and I want you to distort the square into this rectangle. And basically what we show is it can do the first task no problem, it's going from low symmetry to high symmetry, it can't do the second task. And the reason for this is because it is symmetrically ill-defined because the question is, well, which rectangle did you want? There's two degenerate rectangles. If I'm a rotation equivariant network, I'm like, well, I can't tell whether you want the one around, let's orient it around Y or the one around Z because you could just, or um, X, you could just change your coordinate system. And if you, this is in a recent paper that we have on the archive and it's, it's, it's in the resource slide later. This is what the network output is. So if instead of articulating the displacements as vectors, I do it as in terms of spherical harmonics, so we kind of see the full symmetry of the problem. What you can see is that, so the blue points on the, on the left, the blob is just supposed to overlap with the orange point. That means it's doing a good job. If it overlaps with the orange point, it's doing a superb job. So the one on the left, perfect. The one on the right, you can see there's actually a degeneracy in its predictions. That's why the lobes are smaller because you're basically averaging two signals. So if you imagine kind of the normally sized blob and normally sized blob and you sum them, um, you, get, you get this or you get like an average. Yeah, so it's gonna average those two, those two symmetrically degenerate choices. So that's kind of cool. But what's even cooler is that we can actually use gradients of the network to the input to figure out how did we need to change the input such that we could do this task. 
And what it's able to do is, so the inputs on these individual points is just like a one. It's just a, it's just a number. Uh, so it's just a scalar. But if I allow it to have inputs that I initially set to zero, but it, it can, they can be higher order spherical harmonics, what it says is that it learns that, oh, you can have L equals two or L equals four uh, contributions on each of these points, and that breaks symmetry such that it can fit the model. And this, what this, what this actually means, what this actually means is that it's choosing, it's saying the y direction is different from the x direction. That's what this blob is showing you, because you can kind of see it's, it starts off as a sphere and then it goes whoop. And so it's kind of going, okay, I'm symmetric, like I can't tell the difference between, you know, minus x minus y, those look the same. It's like a double-headed ray. Um, but I can tell that this is different from this. And so that's what it's able to learn from gradients. And so in this paper that I have linked below, we basically mathematically prove that all that equivariant neural networks have this property and that you can use it to find symmetry breaking inputs. Okay. Um, if I, yeah, I just want to say like we are at 11. I know that some folks will leave. Uh, you can please feel free to finish your uh, lecture, but I just wanted to say that for everyone who's leaving, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, we'll have uh, another lecture next Thursday at 9.30. Yeah, thank you all for your questions. I really appreciate it. It was really fun. Sorry to interrupt. No, it's okay. Yeah, no, so please. just this is a quick recap. Um, if you have the slides, I might just skip this. But we've talked about symmetry. We've talked about how to make a model symmetry aware. We've talked about the difference between invariant and equivariant um, and why you might want to use an equivariant neural network. Um, and that these models can have unintuitive consequences when you embed these symmetries. Um, so I want to give a big shout out to my collaborators and the developers of E3NN, which is the open source repository that we use for Euclidean neural networks. So if you're interested, this is the repository for you. I also want to give a shout out to my friend Tani, who helped me with some of the graphics in this presentation. Um, I want to give a shout out to the TensorField Networks team um, that I was part of. Um, this is one of the first implementations of Euclidean neural networks. And then here are all the resources and I'm going to leave it at that. Feel free to reach out to me via email if you have questions beyond this lecture. And with that said, I'll take any, any remaining questions that folks have. But yeah, thanks. Thank you, Tess, for this great talk and uh, um, for all the work that you put in for all the illustrations and, and graphics, that's, that's it's really awesome. It's a very good overview Thank of the you. entire field, yeah. Um, and thanks for everyone for the questions. I'm not sure if there are more questions here. You see in the chat, I think it's just people are uh, commending you on the lecture and the slides. That's very kind. Those were amazing questions. That was very exciting. So thank you all to everyone who asked questions. And I'm sorry that I totally butchered them as I was reading them. I clearly needed to practice reading questions and doing slides at the same time. I think it's, it's, it's on Zoom, so it's inevitable that it, like there is some, yeah, it's, it's much easier in person, especially yeah. when the speaker is a lively person, and like you're yeah, given animated sort of uh, explanations of things, so yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so I don't, I think we have one last question. One question? Yes. All right. All right. Are there any special considerations for applying symmetries to variational autoencoders, normalizing flows, or other probabilistic graph models? Yes. Um, one thing that's nice about variational autoencoders is that, at least in the, in the context of Euclidean neural networks, which I've done some work on making variational autoencoders. It's hard with discrete geometry to do it in a way that I'm happy with, but uh, it is possible. Um, you want to make sure that your, your middle layer representation isn't just reduced to scalars. Or if you do that, you, you will need to put orientation information back into it before generating. Um, this is actually something that I'm exploring with um, some of my collaborators, we have some slides here. So we've been working on, oh, where to go? 
there. Yeah. So we've been interested in working on variational autoencoders where we basically take local environments and encode them as scalar. So learning invariant representations and then being able to pop them back up uh, into a geometric um, object. But you need to introduce coordinate frames somehow. And so the, the point of that paper is to talk about all the nifty ways that one can do that that are still faithful to the problem. So I don't know if that completely answers your question, but it maybe answers some aspect of it. Can you post the link to the workshop on the Slack channel? Um, I am not actually on the Slack channel, but I think Mustafa can. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think some, some, someone already posted the link there, so it's there. Yeah, so, oh, yeah, sorry. So this, this workshop tomorrow should be really good. It starts at 6 a.m. <laughs> Pacific time because it's an East Coast uh, workshop. But uh, I really, the, the, the talks in the beginning are definitely worth it. There's some great speakers, um, particularly, I've, I've, Taco Cohen actually came to Berkeley Lab a while ago uh, and is a, is a good colleague of mine and he's giving a talk and that'll be on a lot of, of these natural uh, graph uh, networks. So that should be really interesting. So I'm excited to see that talk and many of the other talks. Sounds good. I think uh, that's the last of the questions. Again, if you have more questions, you want to look at the material and slides and you have more of them and maybe there will be like more of the talks tomorrow and you have questions on those, especially to Tess, please post them on Slack channel and I'll find Tess trying to uh, get her to answer some of those questions. Yeah, uh, for sure. I'm happy to answer yeah. any questions. My email's there. Yeah. So, thanks everyone. It was super Thank fun. Thank you. Thanks again, Tess. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone for joining. Bye. Bye.